uh, here are some review articles. Um, so this one is a TASI lecture from 2002. And this is sort of the standard reference, um, which is soon after uh, the initial developments. Um, but so both of these take sort of a more traditional approach, starting from D-brains and string theory. Um, whereas um, this is a TASI lecture from 2010 uh, by Joe Polchinski, which I uh, had the opportunity to attend. Um, and so he starts presenting a more modern perspective um, of sort of the generality of the ADSC of two course ones, um, but also talking about sort of stringy physics. Um, and then these two review articles are actually talking about um, applications to condensed matter theory, and we're trying to get condensed matter theorists uh, interested, so then they don't assume anything about string theory. So if Maybe for this audience, that might be appealing, um, although they do assume you know something about condensed matter. Um, and of course, there are many uh, original references. I just wanted to point out um, these are sort of the two big ones, um, especially this one, obviously. Um, and it now has 12,000 citations. According this is only more than the one verse the model. Yeah, I believe that's in the, like around 5,000. <laughs> and if you and then if you divide by the number of years. Right, citations per year, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, so obviously this is a, a big uh, topic. It's uh, very exciting. Um, yeah. yeah, when I first gave a lecture on ADS-CFT in grad school, it was 7,000. <laughs> so it's gone up. Uh, it's still going up quite rapidly. Uh, so roughly, what is it? What are we talking about? Uh, it's the statement that, okay, this is, sort of, this is sort of a joke, but ADS is equal to CFT. So you have a D plus one anti-de-sitter space and a D-dimensional CFT, and these are supposed to be the same thing. So what do we mean? So this is on the left-hand side, string theory, or quantum gravity in asymptotic the anti de Sitter space. And on the right hand side, we'll have a local conformal field theory. in D dimensions. This will be a gauge theory, typically. Okay. So on the left-hand side, we have a theory of gravity in D plus one dimensions. On the right-hand side, we have a local field theory in D dimensions. Okay. And then what do we mean by the equal sign? So we mean there's a precise mapping between partition functions states, local operators, Wilson loops, etc. So this is a duality where these are just two different representations of the same physics somehow. Um, why is it a joke? Oh, I just mean that, that writing this as an equation is kind of a joke. Yeah. Obviously, it's not literally doesn't literally mean anything. Uh, <clears throat> one one point to make about the equality is only this duality property is true. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The yeah the duality is not a joke. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when I talk about this equality, though, it's one one point that's worth emphasizing uh, is that it only you can only really identify. Um, the gauge invariant operators. Um, and those are only the physical things to talk about. So you won't find any of the gauge symmetry on the right-hand side and the left-hand side, for example. Only uh, gauge invariant operators can be mapped um, across in the dictionary. And similarly, on the left-hand side, you have diffeomorphism invariants, but that doesn't appear 
in any sense uh, on the right hand side. Okay. So why is this uh, so exciting? Um, so there's sort of two reasons. One is that it's a holographic duality, which um, there are some other examples, but this is sort of the best one. Um, and there were some very general arguments from gravity that something like this sh should be true. Um, that you should have some emergent uh, dimension coming out, um, or, or put another way, that uh, when you have a gravitational theory that there's some description um, in one lower dimension. So in, that intuition comes from, for example, black hole physics where the entropy scales like the area, just roughly. Um, so it's exciting just uh, from that point of view. Um, but a lot of the excitement comes because it's a very non-trivial, um, uh, strong, weak duality. So calculations that are easy um, on the left-hand side are strongly coupled on the right-hand side uh, and vice versa. So that means that um, you can start saying things about strongly coupled field theory. So this is a new tool to start understanding strongly coupled field theory, um, which is always a, a difficult problem. Um, when we talk about sort of holographic duality, I should clarify that uh, there's sort of a trivial uh, notion of holography one could worry about where you could, the S matrix could be thought of as sort of a holographic description where you just integrate out all of space and then you would get a, code, a, a one lower dimension description. Um, but somehow that's not what we mean by holography. The fact that um, on the right hand side we get a local field theory so that the entropy um, is an extensive quantity that scales like the volume on the right hand side. Um, and that this is nice in some sense and not just some non-local mess, um, which is what you would expect uh, generically if you just tried to integrate out some region of space. Um, so, so it's a little unclear actually what we mean by holography uh, if you start thinking about it at that level. But I, somehow there's some niceness about the uh, lower dimensional description, the hologram that we want. Um, so because of this strong weak duality, there's been many um, what I'll call loosely applications, which I'll just sort of mention. Um, I'm putting in quotes because not all of them are strictly applications. Some of them are just sort of an interesting interplay of ideas between two, uh, ADS-CFT and another field. Um, but just strongly coupled field theory, QCD, condensed matter physics. So there's like a holographic superconductor and some other explorations of strange metals and so on. Uh, this has been sort of some new phases found. Um, there's been some interest, very beautiful interplay with the conformal bootstrap. Um, some, a lot of great work with entanglement entropy. Um, thought experiments and Investigations of quantum gravity. Uh, some renormalization group arguments. Um, some, some proofs uh, were made first in the context of ADS-CFT and then shown to be generally true in field theory. Um, there's this famous eta over S uh, conjecture, which is not, there are now known counterexamples, but it sort of spurred on some very interesting developments, uh, relativistic hydrodynamics. So in that context, some new uh, coefficients uh, in the hydrodynamic expansion were found um, in the context of ADS-CFT. And then there's been a lot of interplay with integrability. Um, and I'm sure the list goes on. What's that ATOP? 
So that's the viscosity over the entropy density. Yeah. And the QCD applications? Oh. Uh, so <coughs> the claim is I'm not an expert on applications uh, to QCD, uh, but the claim is that uh, in a certain regime, QCD is approximately conformal. Um, and so you might hope uh, that you can get sort of in the same universality class and then uh, say something about QCD in the strongly coupled regime in, some, in the so-called conformal window that people talk about. Um, one of the things people looked at is actually this eta over s. Uh, when you have uh, experiments at RIC, um, yeah, um, but that's I haven't studied that in detail. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, I mean, there's been, there's also been uh, a lot of work trying to from sort of deep brainy, uh, you know, top-down construction, come up with something that's close to QCD, um, which has been more or less successful. I, don't, I haven't followed it closely. Um, um, so at this point, I want to give sort of a, it'll be sort of a motivation for why something like this um, should be true. And it also will be the uh, I'll also introduce the only string theory um, that you'll need to know uh, for the rest uh, of the presentation. Um, yeah. So let's just talk about string theory for a second. Um, the only thing that I really want you to know is sort of the perturbative structure. Um, and that is that string perturbation theory, you have two parameters. One is called alpha prime, the Reggie slope parameter. Um, it's also one over the string tension. And it's also the string length squared. Uh, People prefer to talk about alpha prime mostly just for historical reasons and because uh, nobody can decide where the twos and the pi's go um, for the other two quantities. But, um, <clears throat> or some people decide, but not everyone agrees, I guess. And the other uh, parameter is called g-string, the string coupling. Um, if you have heard that strings, string theory has no free parameters, then you might wonder, what am I, I, what am I talking about here? Um, well, the string coupling is secretly just the expectation value of the VEV of the dilaton, um, but we don't need to know that, really. Okay. And alpha prime is dimensionful, um, so it's not actually a free parameter in that sense. Okay. So what is alpha prime? Well, it's one over the tension, so it controls how floppy the strings are. Okay. So when alpha prime is small, for example, uh, that means the tension is large, then that means that to get higher harmonics of the string uh, it requires a lot of energy. Um, and so basically, uh, you only get the fundamental modes of the string in that limit, and then those will be the massless states, um, which will give the low energy effective field theory will just be supergravity in that case. Okay. Um, you won't get the whole uh, Reggie trajectory. Okay. What does G string do? It controls how easily strings break and join. So it behaves more like a traditional coupling constant, maybe. Um, so for example, so the string perturbation theory is a double expansion, you can think of it, in, in these two parameters. So if you have uh, some scattering process in string theory, and this is the only 
diagram I'm going to draw like this. Um, let me just. So I start with I have you know three asymptotic string states, and then um, I want to know the amplitude. Then I would have sort of a tree level thing, which is the so-called pants diagram, which comes with a G string. And then there's another diagram which is order G string cubed where I have like an extra hole in the middle. Okay. And so from the space-time point of view, this is an extra loop, right? And then there are, of course, higher orders. And so for each sort of topology, then I have an expansion in alpha prime, which is how all the sort of wiggling that the string can do uh, with that fixed topology. Okay. So that is there's a topological expansion. So I'm using sort of a script G as a sum over genus. Um, with G string basically to the Euler character or minus the Euler character, I can never remember. So curly G is basically the number of handles, the number of holes. Uh, B is the number of boundaries. Okay. So in this picture, I have three boundaries. Uh, this is genus zero. Um, so then it's order G string, like I said. Genus uh, is just the number of holes. Okay. So a sphere is genus 0, torus is genus 1, etc. The number of handles. And I'm, I'm not familiar with these diagrams. If I'm to understand this, this would be similar to a Feynman diagram, except now I'm thinking of scattering a G string. Yeah. Loops. Yeah. Okay. You don't need to know any of the details except just this. That there's some expansion like as this form, okay? Um, right. But then, uh, go back to you. You see those two parameters. So yeah. Uh, I mean, if for different choices, two parameters, this alpha and the GS, mm -hmm. um, do they correspond to different theory or something different? Uh, no. Well, so alpha prime is actually dimensionful, yeah. so. Really, you have to talk about something in comparison to alpha prime, so like some momentum scale. Um, and so the idea is uh, if you have in a low momentum or low energy uh, limit, you can't excite these higher harmonics. Um, so then when I say alpha prime is small, uh, that's, it's in comparison to some energy scale. Um, like a variable state. Yeah. Yeah, and what I meant by saying this is that uh, different G strings are not different theories, they're different backgrounds. Uh, basically, the, there's a field in string theory called the dilaton that it can have different VEVs, and that VEV fixes the value that gives G string. So it's not really a coupling constant, it's a VEV. Okay, so Just like the Higgs gives, gives mass. Gives mass by getting a VEV, right? Uh -huh. So, the same idea, you get a coupling constant by this field getting a VEV. Uh -huh. So, when G string is zero, then the strings can't join or break apart anymore. Okay. Okay, then, then suppose I want to think uh, this like a scattered matrix element. Yeah. So, so, this G string corresponds to what in, in, in that language? Uh, I was just about to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was the next thing I was going to say, uh, is that G string, you can, s right, so if I go to sort of traditional Feynman diagrams, then this is like this diagram, and then this is a one loop diagram, right? So it's something like, okay. Um, so G string plays the role of 
h bar in space-time, or Newton's constant. Alpha prime, uh, this might be confusing, so because we're not doing string theory here, but uh, you can actually, there's a sense in which it's the h bar for the world sheet uh, description, but uh, you can just think of it as controlling how floppy the, the string is. Um, to make this more precise, um, in 10 dimensional flat space, Newton's constant um, is given by this. So g string squared is going to be basically Newton's constant. But because Newton's constant appears out front of the action, uh, it's h bar, so it's controlling loops. So it's counting loops. That's why it's counting handles. Um, so the low energy effective field theory um, takes a form roughly like there's an expansion in alpha prime. This is just uh, supergravity. And then these are higher derivative corrections. Okay. So this is like Wilsonian effective field theory for string theory. So alpha prime is like a string of the gravitational interaction? In fact, by that equation, is it that you uh, correction that? Well, I'd rather say that G string is more like that. But I mean, alpha prime is, is in here as well. So um, because what I mean, if I, so here is going to be like my usual Einstein Hilbert action plus uh, whatever I get for supergravity for the super fields, uh, so the gravitino and, and uh, the other fields. Um, but for instance, here will be something like uh, Ricci squared or Riemann squared, roughly. Um, so these are higher derivative corrections to gravity that, um, I mean, you should think of alpha prime um, as being very small, because it's the string length squared, so you want to think of that length scale as being close to, say, the Planck scale. Um, OK, so then that's all the string theory we should really need. And then let's compare this um, to gauge theory. So this is part of the motivation uh, for this correspondence uh, goes back to this, these observations, um, which I'm sort of presenting now by Polyakov and Tuft and Suskind um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, I'm sorry, Steve. Yeah. The, yes, you say that think about upper prime is small. Um, if I want to be doing perturbation theory in this sense, then G string should be small. Otherwise, uh, I mean, when G string is order one, then this I can't do perturbation theory like this anymore. Um, so the question is whether you're in a perturbative regime for gravity or not is determined by, that's like g-string. Okay. GS also means it's not rounded, right? Yeah. E, uh, yes, so there'll be, right, because there's a 1 over g-Newton here in the Einstein-Hilbert term, for example. Oh, I just see. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to get across that there's these two parameters. There's a double expansion that has this topological character. Um, a lot of people wouldn't really even talk about this for ADS CFT uh, for this audience, but I think it's really crucial to understand that there are two kinds of corrections 
um, to supergravity, classical supergravity, uh, when you talk about ADS-CFT. And so that's why I'm emphasizing this. Um, also as motivation, because I can connect this to the gauge theory. So if I have SUN gauge theory, my Lagrangian is something like, I'm going to be very schematic here. This is just Tuft's large N expansion, which I'm kind of hoping that you guys have seen before, plus other stuff if you have other fields and so on. Um, <clears throat> so Tuft's idea uh, was, is there another expansion aside from just uh, small g mills? Um, and maybe I can expand an n uh, being large. So we should think about n being large, and then try and do an expansion 1 over n. Um, turns out that only really makes sense if I also simultaneously take g yang mills small. So I apologize that there's like five different g's already on the board, but hopefully you can keep them all straight. Um, and you want to do this in such a way that you hold what's called the Tuft coupling, lambda um, fixed, which is g and mill squared n. Okay. So in this large n limit, um, a lot of nice things happen. So I have my gauge field, which is an adjoint representation of SUN. So it has some indices, it's a matrix, it has some indices A and B. Um, so I can write it like this, where TA is the generator of SUN. And so capital A runs from 1 to n squared minus 1. So basically, what we want to say is for n large, we can drop the minus 1 here. And then we can think of this adjoint representation as being a bifundamental, um, an n by n bar representation. So see what I mean? Think about a propagator. So this is a mu at x, a b, a nu, a y, c d. I'm being schematic here, obviously. And this takes the form delta AC, delta BD. And then there's a minus 1 over N. And the idea is we can just drop this in large N. And then that means we can replace all our gluons um, by double lines. So you, basically, you can think of, don't, don't take this too literally, uh, you can think of like the quark becoming two quark, uh, the gluon becoming two quarks, um, just at the level of representation theory, that's what I mean. Okay, so I'm hoping that the, you've all seen this a couple times before, probably. Okay. So then the Feynman rules um, are each vertex, you get 1 over g and mil squared. Uh, each propagator, you get g and mil squared. And then each loop gives you an n because you sum over the colors. Okay. So if I take a diagram with what's called um, number of vertices V, the number of propagators or edges E, and then the number of loops, or I'll call them faces, F, um, then I'll have 1 over G yang mil squared to the E, 
angle squared to the V, and then N to the F for a given diagram. Yeah, 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 you're of course. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And then yes, now it's good. Okay, you're right. Of course. Um, now let's just rewrite this uh, in terms of um, n and Tuff's coupling. Um, so then I get lambda over n uh, to the e, and then I get um, lambda n over lambda um, to the v, and n to the f, which is n uh, to the f plus v minus e and then lambda to the e minus v. Okay. So if we look at this power, um, if you remember so something about uh, polyhedra in high school math, uh, there's something called the Euler character, chi, uh, which is f plus v minus e. Um, and it happens to be actually equal to 2 minus uh, twice uh, the genus that we were talking about. Okay. So in diagrams, what are we talking about? To give some examples. So in this double line notation, so for example, this diagram would be four faces or four loops. Um, then it would be four vertices and should be six edges. So let's see if we can do that. So let's see, one, two, three, and four vertices. Um, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six edges. Um, and then we have one, two, three, and then outside a fourth face. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, first of all, you, your lambda conversion lambda to n again is something strange. Mm -hmm. Did I get it wrong? Yeah. It's still, for example, g, right? If, if, you, if, you, if you use that equation, g, g squared will be lambda over n. That should be n over lambda. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. The other one should be off. Yeah. Obviously. And then this should be right, hopefully. No. No. It's F plus E minus E. <laughs> Let's see. Sorry? Then the lambda should be V minus E. Right. Um, so all you can do apparently is f plus v minus e. Oh, okay. So there is something else. Uh, no, I think, okay, I think, I think, I think actually, I think right. I had this right that, before. That's right, that's right. It's just so the location. Right. It's the other side. Yeah, yeah, this, right. this was right before. That's right, that's right. Uh, has to go yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, no, this. Um, so then 1 over g yang mil squared uh, should be n over lambda, so this is e. Yeah. So if you write that, then the first term should be v, right? The second term oh, yeah, should be v. Yeah. The, the, 
the opposite direction. This one? Yeah, that's because if you write as vertex, we should, should be right. Yeah, there. yeah, okay. Okay. And then G goes like. Then overlap, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully I got it right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You factor out the one over. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so f plus v minus e, and then this is lambda to the e minus v, which is what I had originally in my notes. But yeah, this is still right. Good. Okay. So what was that g? Minus 2 minus 2g was that g? This is g. Uh, it's, it's exactly this kind of g. So it's the counting of the number of handles. Okay. Uh, so yeah. why there uh, number of loops is 4 again? The phase the Faces. Uh, so it's, I'm counting this is a loop. Right. This is a loop. Right. This is a loop. Right. This is a loop. Oh. And so in terms of faces, this is a face, this is a face, this is a face, and then outside is a face. Okay. And then if you imagine identifying a point in infinity, then it's a sphere. So it has genus zero. Okay. As an example uh, that does not have genus zero, you can do a diagram like this. Um, I cannot be. I cannot visualize that. <laughs> so it's not. It's not planar. It's not planar. Oh, not planar. Right. Just pull the inner bar to the outside, yeah. and then it becomes planar. Okay, uh, as long as you don't attach any external legs. No, because it, you'd have to twist. So let's let's <laughs> count it. So this has just two loops. Uh, yep, two loops. Uh, should be four vertices. And six edges. Let's see, uh, one, uh, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, how to visualize this again? So think about a circle, and then yeah. it has a bar that goes like yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, and this is supposed to be like jet on the two dimensions, right? So. <laughs> yeah, it's so this has chi uh, Euler character zero, um, which means as genus one. So it's a torus. Okay, so I'll leave that as a, a visualization exercise. Uh, <laughs> Is there any software to help? <laughs> yeah. um, but what I wanted to, for you to take away from this um, is that in this Tuft large n expansion of SUN gauge theory, there's a very similar looking expansion to string theory where I can sum over a genus. And that's counting powers of 1 over n. Um, and then within each power of n, um, I'd have an expansion in Tuft's constant. Um, so I haven't talked about the coupling constant lambda. Uh, because of the minus e minus v, it might look kind of funny. Uh, but, ac but actually, it is more like a traditional coupling constant. Um, for example, if you just do bubble diagrams uh, at, at g is 0, um, so this you can think of as having one vertex. Um, so it's tuf, uh, uh, n squared and then tuf to the power 0.
The next diagram would be something like this. This is n squared lambda, and it has two vertices. And um, this one has is a n squared. Lambda squared. So indeed, as you get more and more vertices at a given order in, in 1 over n, um, you get higher and higher powers of lambda. So it is actually like our usual coupling, notion of coupling constant. Okay. Or actually, uh, square root lambda. Yeah. OK. So you can see that uh, these two expansions look uh, at least superficially, very similar. Um, no corresponding B. Uh, well, you can. So, I mean, B is basically giving you the number of external legs, and you can actually uh, play the same game here. Uh, with, but. Um, but right here, you know. Here I'm just talking, do, doing uh, bubble diagrams um, without external legs. So then there's no B, uh, analog of B. You, you can make it a little more precise with, with B as well. Um, I didn't do that in my notes here. Um, and so people had noticed this um, and suggested that when lambda is large, um, then basically you would get a large number of vertices and maybe these tuft diagrams start looking like something like a world sheet where you would integrate over all the vertices. It would be like integrating over all the positions of the, of the string. Okay. Um, but it was not very precise um, exactly how that was going to work. Um, so now, Let me just state um, the most uh, popular version or precise version of or, 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 uh, yeah, the most popular uh, incarnation of ADS CF CFT, which comes from D3 brains. You don't have to know what that means. I'm just sort of for context, um, which is type. So I'm just going to state precisely. Uh, this particular incarnation of ADS CFT for reference. So it's type 2B string theory. Um, in asymptotically ADS5 cross S5 with string coupling G string um, and both. Uh, ADS5 and S5 having radius r. So ADS turns out to have a radius. Uh, we'll talk about that in a, a moment. And in type 2b string theory, our supergravity, um, the D3 brains couple to a five form uh, anti symmetric uh, field strength, uh, basically, with five indices. Um, F mu, nu, rho, sigma, lambda, um, which is self-dual. Um, and you integrate this over the flux um, of the field strength through the S5. Um, and that, has, that uh, number has to be quantized in injury units. Um, and so we'll call that n. Um, and n you can think of if you care. You don't have to care. It's like the number of D3 brains. Okay. But, um, so on the one hand, you have this. This is the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, um, you have n equals 4, super uh, uh, sun, uh, super yang mills, with coupling constant g yang mills. In its super conformal phase. Huh? 
And the claim is that these two things are equal. Um, and we'll, I'll give you the first elements of the dictionary, and then this will explain why I was emphasizing the fact that there are these two parameters. Um, so 2 pi g string is going to be related to g ng mil squared, um, which you might have guessed from uh, what I had written over there, hopefully. And this radius r to the fourth power is given by g string and alpha prime squared. Um, I only put this for reference. I'm not going to talk about it more. But um, in Ing Mills, we have a in potential instanton angle, um, theta i, and that can be related to the VEV of a field in uh, type 2b supergravity called C0. Um, it's useful to rewrite these to get intuition where, so remember, alpha prime is just a string length squared. And then this is the 10 dimensional Planck length, so it's the appropriate power of G Newton. And that's just given by n. Okay. So what we can see is that the Tuft coupling is related to the size of this space, in some sense, in string units. Okay. So the alpha prime corrections that I was mentioning, that expansion is controlled by the Tuft coupling. And when the Tuft coupling is large, that means the size of the spacetime um, is large compared to the string scale. And then I can forget about all these higher modes of the string, and I can just do supergravity. On the other hand, n gets related to the size of the spacetime measured in Planck units. And so this is con n is controlling quantum gravity. So when n is large, then the size of the spacetime is large in Planck units. Um, and so that means that I don't have to worry about loops um, in spacetime. Okay. So when n and lambda are both large, I can just do classical supergravity. Okay. But I wanted to point out that there's sort of two kinds of corrections, okay. both in um, higher derivative corrections, which are controlled uh, on the CFT side by lambda, and there are loop corrections um, controlled by n. Just say it again, repeat again about that. <laughs> I don't know okay. really get it. Yeah, the first lambda, for example, lambda two. Yeah. So when, when that becomes large, yes. R is large compared to the string length. String length. So what's R again? R is just here, we'll talk about it more, but it's the si the radius, the, the size of ADS five and the S five. So the S five is a five sphere, um, so it has a radius. Turns out ADS is kind of a generalization of a sphere. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, and so it also has a radius, sort of a length scale associated with it. Um, if you like, you can think of this as just giving the cur characteristic curvature scale. Okay. So if the curvature is very low, when R is large, when R is large um, then when it's low in, the, in, in string units, then that means I don't have to worry about these higher derivative corrections I mentioned. Okay. And I just get supergravity. But possibly, if I'm just saying lambda is large but not talking about n, then I possibly could have to deal with loops or quantum gravity, uh, which would be annoying because that's sort of what I don't know how to do, right? So if I also take n large at the same time, then the curvature scales are small compared to the Planck scale. And then I don't have to worry about doing quantum gravity. I can just do classical gravity. Is that clear? So is, uh, is it expected that everything breaks down for um, any higher order thing with the charges? So is there specula are there speculations that um, uh, in terms of the duality could, could exist um, beyond? Um, 
the belief is that this duality holds uh, for all la n and lambda. And um, to the extent that we've been able to probe that, that seems to be true. So you can compute uh, some things which are uh, protected. Um, and then you can compute the dead strong and weak coupling um, and see that it agrees. But Uh, that means that uh, a quantity like an index uh, doesn't change when you change the coupling constant. Um, so then that means that you can compute it at weak coupling, and it has to agree. It has, it has to remain unchanged at strong coupling even when you don't have control over the theory. Um, and so you can compute these sorts of quantities to check uh, the correspondence. Um, in both, on both sides, yeah. For alpha prime? Uh, so, there are, uh, I mean, I think, let me think for a second. For alpha prime, there are, uh, yeah, there are some results in sort of a perturbative, perturbative expansion for, um, in one over lambda, if you like. Basically, uh, actually, I think, yeah, there are some all orders results as well um, by people like Setlin, or Kitty Setlin. And, um, and how does it map into the visuality? Uh, do they um, sketch theory? What? Sorry, what? I'm not sure. I, I was wondering the duality. Um, for higher for higher order terms in the alpha prime expansion. Yes. So what is uh, the corresponding uh, piece um, on the angle side? Uh, oh. It's it's lambda. So. Yes. So it's, it's sort of yeah exactly. So it's the correspondence sort of still still holding. Yes. Okay. That's the claim. Okay. But is, and, is it? Uh, and there is. For which one is it just? Or? Uh. I would have to dig through the references to see. Um, but there are some all orders in lambda type results that have been checked, for example. Uh, there's pretty strong evidence that, um, that it should hold to all orders in lambda. Okay. Uh, actually, lambda is probably, uh, or, or alpha prime is probably um, better checked than 1 over n corrections. If you, so I think for, so there are some all order results in, in alpha prime that you can do. But for n, it like, anyway, there's something called a uh, Penrose limit, for example, where these become important and then you can, anyway. Um, but for n, when you have loops in the bulk, um, then I think only there's only been done a certain amount of work in terms of corrections in a perturbative. I don't think they're non. I'm not sure of any. I can't think of any non-perturbative results uh, for n right now. But I would have to check. Okay. Um, so I have another. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's the claim. That's the claim. What was that? Absolutely, yeah. The, the problem is, um, which maybe I'll get to a bit, uh, is that uh, it's not clear what the right variables are to talk about in the bulk. We don't understand the bulk at all uh, when you have when, you, when it's very quantum, uh, because it's a non-normalizable, I mean, gravity is non-normalizable, and then string theory, the string expansion breaks down. Um, and so we don't have very many, we're not even sure like what the right variables are. Um, and so we don't understand the ADS-CFT dictionary very well in that regime to say some th interesting things about quantum gravity uh, by just doing some gauge theory calculation. But there is definitely an interest, and in, in people have done some 
uh, stuff in that direction. But. Um, I'll skip that. All right, let's talk about what, what in the world is anti disitter space. So in all incarnations of um, ADS-CFT, there will be the, both these two kinds of corrections to keep in mind. Um, so it, this lesson um, from this particular incarnation uh, is important to get intuition more generally. So anti desitter space. What is it? Um, so it's a maximally symmetric space. So um, it has the most number of killing vectors that you can, independent killing vectors that you can have. Um, that may not mean much to some of the audience. It's a constant curvature, homogeneous, space um, like a sphere. So it's a very symmetric space like a sphere, um, but with negative curvature instead of positive curvature. Um, it's also a vacuum solution to Einstein's equations. with negative cosmological constant. Um, it also occurs very naturally um, when you have, whenever you have um, an extremal black hole or a black brain, then you will get some kind of ADS2 so for a black hole, you get an ADS2. For a black uh, brain, you'll get some higher dimensional ADS when you zoom in to the near horizon region, which is how all of this got started, was by studying some extremal black brains, um, which were supposed to be the strong coupling description of these D3 brains. Um, and that led to the correspondence, but we're not gonna, I'm not gonna emphasize that. But that's how, where it comes from. Um, in this example, for you know, what's playing the role of this negative cosmological constant, you might wonder. Um, it's basically this, this five-form flux um, behaves like a negative uh, cosmological constant, if you uh, plug it in. If you're interested uh, in Polchinski's uh, lectures, he uh, explains that. But um, I don't think I have time to talk about that. So let's, uh, as a warm up for figuring out what ADS is, uh, because some people uh, expressed uh, that they didn't remember anything from general relativity, and maybe didn't even know what a metric was, uh, let's just talk about a sphere for a second. Uh, so you could think of a P sphere as defined um, by embedding it in. Uh, P plus one uh, Euclidean space. So that is, you start with a P plus one dimensional space, which I'll use capital X's for. Uh, just simple Euclidean metric. Um, and then you impose a constraint or you look at the locus of points that satisfy this condition, I think everyone should agree that this should define a p-sphere. Um, it should be clear that this condition um, 
is an SOP plus one invariant, so I should expect my sphere to have an SOP plus one symmetry. Okay. So for example, uh, let's do everyone's favorite, p equals two. Uh, let's solve the constraint. So you have x1 is r sine theta cos phi, x2 is r sine theta uh, sine phi, x3 is r cos theta. So I think you can easily see that if you take x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, then it's always r squared for all theta and phi. So then it's a little bit of work. So dx1 is just r uh, cos theta cos phi uh, d theta minus r uh, sine theta sine phi d phi. dx2 is r cos theta sine phi d theta plus r sine theta cos phi d phi dx3 is minus r sine theta d theta. Okay, so now let's work out the induced metric on my uh, locus of points satisfying this constraint. So I just plug these in here um, and I find, so the induced metric or the metric on the sphere I just plug these in. Um, so what happens? So let's look at cross terms. Um, so I have this kind of cross term. I'm sorry, I have this kind of cross term. And I have this kind of cross term. Um, and you can see that they cancel because they have opposite signs. So there's going to be no d theta d phi terms. So I'm just going to have d theta squared and uh, d phi squared. So look at d theta squared. So I have r squared, cos squared, cos squared, r squared, cos squared, sine squared, so then I get just r squared, cos squared, plus r squared, sine squared, so then I just get r squared, d theta squared. Um, and then I have uh, the d phi squared terms, so I just have these two, so I have r squared, sine squared, sine squared, and then r squared, sine squared, cos squared, so then I just get r squared, sine squared, and hopefully this all looks uh, familiar. And that's the usual metric on the sphere. OK. So I apologize for the review. Um, if you like, a fun exercise is to do this for projective coordinates and then do it for p spheres. And you can have lots of fun. Uh, OK. What's ADS? So, it's just a generalization of this. So let's take ADS um, n, I guess. And I'm going to embed it in one higher dimension, so that n plus one dimensional space. The catch is that that space is going to have two times. Don't worry, I'm not. You should just think of this as sort of a trick. Um, well, it turns out to be a very useful trick uh, in other situations, too, um, to get the ADS metric um, that I'm after. Okay. This should just be n minus 2, right? Uh, no, 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 I was right. I was right. Okay. Yeah, I was right. And then uh, similarly, so this has an SO2, comma, n minus 1 uh, symmetry. That's the, the Lorentz scoop, if you like. So I'm going to impose an SO2, comma, n minus 1 invariant condition. Like this. Uh, So sometimes I call it, I think for the rest of the, my notes, I call it L instead of R. But this is 
um, the analog. That's that's R. Okay. So just uh, so this will have an SO2 kind of n minus one isometry, just like the sphere has an SOP plus one isometry. Um, but let's let's solve the constraint. Um, there are a couple different, well, several different ways of solving the constraint that give you different coordinates for ADS space. Um, for our purposes, uh, we just need two um, that are good to see. One is called global coordinates, and it's more like what we did here. Um, so I'll solve the constraint by taking x minus 1 and x0 to have a cosh row. Because I have this minus sign, I'm going to use hyperbolic uh, trig functions. And then x, uh, that's n minus 1 vector, I'll have, oops, this should be cosh. Cinch row, and then some vector y, which will be some coordinate on a sphere, unit sphere. So y squared equals 1. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that. OK, so I'll, in the interest of time, spare you the details. But you just go through exactly what we just did to find the S2 metric. And you find that in global coordinates, the ADS n uh, metric takes the form okay so this uh, d omega comes from uh, this y which is on a sphere unit sphere so this is the n minus 2 sphere metric um, Rho should be positive um, for n bigger than 2. Okay. So it's like a radius. There's a, a radial direction. Um, you see tau here comes with a minus sign. So that's a time direction. Okay, so this is a Lorentzian uh, manifold. But there's something a little funny. Um, when I have this embedding with cosine and sine tau, um, this suggests that tau should be 2 pi periodic. Uh, which would mean I'd have a closed time-like curve here if I kept that condition identifying uh, 0 to 2 pi. But you'll see that there's no obstruction once I have the metric in front of me to just taking tau um, to be the real line, and that's called going to the universal cover um, to get rid of the closed timeline curves. Um, so this, when people talk about ADS, this is what they mean with tau going over the real line. They don't mean this thing, um, which just comes about because you've embedded it, and there's no good way to embed it uh, in one higher dimension with having negative curvature everywhere and not having a closed timeline curve, basically. Um, OK, so these are called uh, global coordinates um, because they cover the entire uh, manifold of n-dimensional antidecitor space. Yeah, I'll skip that. So uh, a post-core ADS, the one that you treat how to be periodic or not, um, the Technically, this is called the universal cover of ADS. Okay. However, when any physicist says anti-de-sitter space, they mean this. They don't mean that with closed time-like curves. I mean, you can think of this going to the cover as just like you have a cylinder. You know, it's like 2 pi periodic. But because it's flat everywhere, I can just trivially take that coordinate to be the whole num line. So I can just unwrap it, paste the, an infinite number of them together, and get a, 
a plane. Okay. Um, Um, so these coordinates are nice because uh, they cover the whole manifold. Um, rho is a, a radius, a radial direction. Um, and when you take rho very large, then I have um, an n minus 2 sphere at the boundary. That'll be what I'll call the boundary of ADS. Okay. Um, so that would mean, because I'm going to put the conformal field theory at the boundary, that would mean that I have a conformal field theory on a sphere. Okay. I'd have my gauge theory on a sphere, which we don't usually like. We like flat space. So instead, um, people usually work with um, Poincaré coordinates. Which are defined as follows. So we want to solve. Um, this constraint, um, but using some different coordination. Okay, so turns out we can define first. We can, as a intermediate step, we can define uh, light cone coordinates or, or null coordinates u and v, which are I'll take this x minus one direction and this x n minus one, and pair them up with the plus or minus. Okay. Um, and then I'll have uh, y0. I'll define it as L is x0 over u. And yi is L xi over u. So then you can show that uh, y squared with the usual Minkowski uh, dot product, so with a minus sign here, plus sign there, is L squared over u squared minus x, big X, 0 squared, plus xi, xi, sum over i, okay. or x vector squared. Um, so then this condition becomes, in these coordinates, minus uv, plus, uh, minus x0 squared, and then plus some uh, x, uh, yeah, let me, that's why I didn't use the vector. So this is a sum i equals 1 to um, n minus 2. Yeah, so let's, um, but then this is just what we called y squared u squared over L squared, right? Um, and so I can use this equation to eliminate V, for example. Okay. So if I do that, um, Notice there's a singular point in this coordinate transformation where uh, when u is 0. Um, and that's basically telling you that there's going to be um, an edge to this coordinate patch. So it's not going to cover the whole manifold. In fact, it'll cover the manifold um, in two patches, depending on whether you eliminated v or u. Um, <coughs> but that's OK. Um, so then you go ahead and dv is given by minus l squared of u squared plus y squared over l squared uh, du. And then there's a dy term, which is going to be uh, plus 2u over l squared y dot dy. And this is that Minkowski dot product. Um, So then you find the metric in the same way, just plugging in with these 
infinitesimal length elements. And I'll just give you the answer here. Or this is the usual uh, Minkowski uh, metric in um, n minus 1 dimensions. Okay. But it has some warp factor in front, and then this u is a radial coordinate. It's convenient um, to take one further coordinate transformation to find something called z, um, which is what I'll be talking about. I'll, I'll try to use z mostly. Um, so then this just becomes um, l squared over z squared dz squared plus eta mu nu dy mu dy nu. Okay. So what does this look like? I mean, what, what, what's the intuition here for this space time? So it's this very symmetric space. Um, it's going to have this SO2 comma n minus 1 symmetry. Um, but I can see from these Poincaré coordinates, um, so u is a radial coordinate, um, and then z is 1 over that. Okay, so z is a, like an inverse radius. So um, when z is 0, that means that it's like going to the edge of um, ADS. So z equals 0 would be like the boundary of ADS. Um, and then as I increase z from 0, which is kind of singular, um, so usually I'll have to cut things off um, away from z equals 0. But as I increase z, then these metric factors um, get shrunk. So these transverse distances get smaller and smaller as I go uh, deeper into ADS. Um, and this is a property of hyperbolic space, or Lobachevsky space, I think it's sometimes called. Um, but sort of the upshot of this is, for instance, that uh, for some fixed z, if I have two points, then the geodesic, the shortest path, um, is not to go like this, but is to dip into the z direction to gain some z and go a shorter transverse uh, distance that way, okay. for example. Um, and I guess I'm going to have to stop in a couple minutes. Um, but what there are a couple other things you should note. Um, because of this 1 over z, this singular behavior, it means that as, you, as z goes to 0, then distances are blowing up, right? Um, so it turns out that. That means that massive particles never reach z equals 0, the boundary. Okay. But uh, massless particles do. And they do so in a finite time. Um, so I guess I'll leave that as a homework exercise to convince yourself of. Um, but that means that they can reach um, z equals 0 in a finite time and then come back, for example. And so you have to, uh, to make sense of anything in ADS, you have to give some sort of boundary conditions um, at z equals 0. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Okay. In flat space, you can sort of get, I mean, you still kind of want to talk about boundary conditions, things are not blowing up, but you don't have to be as careful because it takes an infinite amount of time uh, for stuff to reach there. But that's not true in ADS. It has a different causal structure. 
Um, and so I have to put boundary conditions at z equals 0. Um, and I should think of those boundary conditions as being related to what the, the sources in the conformal field theory. Okay. Um, and so that's what the conformal field theory is describing. And I think I'm just going to have to stop there because of time. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. May I ask you a final the question here? Why yeah. is that better than this? Because you go to this point high point. Why is that better than this, 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 this global point? Um, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is it's, it's just algebraically easier to work with because it's just a 1 over z squared out front. Uh, so it, all the equations become much nicer. Um, but people prefer to work in this Poincaré patch because here I just get ordinary Minkowski space uh, on the boundary on my CFT. Here I have my CFT on a sphere. Okay, so if I don't want to do field theory on a sphere, if I want to do it in Minkowski space, then I should work with the Poincaré patch. Yeah. So how much did you cover? Uh, one third, that's a question. Is that one third? I had 14 pages, and I got through seven. <laughs> maybe, maybe we got to do it Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, in two, in two weeks. Um, that would give you. That's fine with me. The, the reason I was asking this, uh, this week is because this guy's leaving oh. on Saturday. He's oh, missing us. Uh, okay. So, Friday, Saturday. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm fine okay. with Friday. It was just a question of, of uh, yeah, how, how much material I can absorb. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can yeah, absorb. no, there is a lot. <laughs> but, but, but imagine, I, I, I can follow it, just though I don't understand it, but I can follow it. What was, what's been said in this? Very, very nice. Got the feeling of it. Um, so if that's okay, I think we should still do it just for the benefit of this young guy. Okay. If you want to know about any of the Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, if you if need to, you can always, if you do not get a slice that you can make that one more. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure, yeah. sure, absolutely. Yeah. Right. It's better to go slowly so we can pick up things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, then just rush through. Yeah. Was this a good pace? I or? think it's good. I, I understand it. I understand it very nice. Yes. OK. Yeah, yeah I, I can really follow. <laughs> OK. But as I said, though I don't really understand all, everything, I can follow. Right. Yeah. That's very clear. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Well, if you could think of a simple exercise that we could learn by doing, more would say that. Um, Homework, that's what you Yeah, so <laughs> I, think there are, I think showing this uh, is a short exercise. That shouldn't take you very long. Um, just refresh your memory about general relativity and show that massless particles reach the boundary of ADS in a finite time. Okay. Um, but what else? Uh, is there anything else that's going to be? I think that might be good enough because I. I mean, the other things I would tend to cover, let me just see. Yeah, I think that would be maybe the best, best thing. Okay, all right, thank you very much.